the Sega Dreamcast, the beloved swan song system from Sega during their final rounds partaking in the console wars, before choosing to bail out due to the success of the Sony PlayStation 2 and the frightening upcoming marketing and tech might of the Microsoft Xbox. But what if I said that rather than intending to compete with Sega, instead Microsoft had wanted to work alongside them. I am Lady Decade and this is the story of the Sega Xbox. Or is it? In a 2013 interview with IGM, Joaquim Kempin, a man who was vice president of Windows sales at Microsoft for 20 years, claims that if you look back through history, Bill Gates always had a fear of the humble game console beneath a television. Gates felt that if the timing and circumstances were right, a device had the potential to metamorphose into a full-blown alternative to the PC, thus threatening Microsoft's dominance as the ultimate force in the computer market. Observing the growing popularity of the Sony PlayStation and the fact that the console was from huge technology giant Sony, this nightmare scenario that Bill Gates had prophesied could happen was looking more and more likely. According to Kempin, Sony was always very arm's length with Microsoft. They bought Windows for their PCs, but when you really take a hard look at that, they were never Microsoft's friend. And Microsoft, in a way, wanted them to be a friend because they knew they had a lot of things they could have cooperated on because they are, in a way, an entertainment company too. I mean, at least a portion of Sony is, and they had some really good things going there. But as soon as they came out with a video console, Microsoft just looked at that and said, well, we have to beat them because everyone loves Bill Gates' microchips, right? As a stride in this direction, Microsoft would begin working directly with Sega on the creation of the Sega Dreamcast platform, the most powerful games console the world had seen yet, and one that had the potential to throw a spanner in the works of Sony's plans. On the 21st of May of 1998, Microsoft proudly announced its partnership with Sega on the Dreamcast, the ultimate home video game system. There is actually still a press release on Microsoft's news center that can be read to this day. It states, Microsoft Corp today announced it will collaborate with Sega Enterprises Limited on Sega's new Dreamcast home video game system, slated for release in Japan on the 20th of November 1998 and in the rest of the world in 1999. As a result of the collaboration, Microsoft will provide an optimised version of the Microsoft Windows CE operating system with integrated DirectX services as the operating system for use with Dreamcast. With the inclusion of Windows CE, Dreamcast will bring the benefits of an advanced Windows-based development environment to the world of console game development for the first time. Using Windows CE, developers will be able to cross-platform titles more efficiently by taking advantage of well-established Win32 and DirectX APIs that are source code compatible with the Windows operating system on the PC. Incorporation of DirectX will also allow the Dreamcast system to capitalize on the momentum towards PC gaming and the ever-increasing body of developers creating games for the Windows platform. So Sega and Microsoft were on one side, a dream team, right? Well, despite the early boasting regarding this collaboration with the Sega Dreamcast hardware, the celebration was short-lived for the two companies, as the Dreamcast would become a short-lived commercial disaster, with Windows CE barely being adopted and less than 50 games being produced that used CE. But, at the very least for Microsoft, it would allow them to view and be part of the console market from close range. 
the arrival to the market of the PlayStation 2 with its marketing hype and capabilities to play DVDs spelt the end for the system, and early indications were showing that Sony's new home console was shaping up to be the most popular game console as of yet. Online, you can find articles published by the likes of CNN.com from the year 2000 that heavily speculate that the PlayStation 2 would be so popular that it would indeed replace the PC, thus making Bill Gates' dark prediction come true. Keith Diefendorf, editor-in-chief of the Microprocessor Report, stated that the new PlayStation 2 with its so-called Emotion Engine possesses extraordinary processing power in a sub-$400 game console. Combine that with a DVD drive and a modular design that will offer simple upgrades to internet access via a standard modem, cable modem or digital subscriber line, and you should have one serious machine. Diefendorf called the console a Trojan horse, and said that although PC makers don't fear them right now, they should, because Sony has things in mind other than just games. That's right, who needs a PC, a job, friends or family for that matter, when you have an emotion engine? These opinions over the period were not surprising as when the PlayStation 2 was officially announced back in March of 1999, Sony themselves had made the bold claim that their system would act as a gateway for all types of home entertainment. They had a product vision where the console would ultimately replace the desktop computer in the home. As discussed already, Bill Gates had been aware of this threat for quite some time, and the Dreamcast Windows CE deal was not the only deal that Microsoft would attempt to strike through this period. Microsoft would reach out to collaborate with Nintendo on a game console, and even Sony themselves. However, both of those anecdotes are part of stories for future videos, which leaves us back with Sega. You see, Microsoft viewed Sega as a company with a common enemy, as they saw Sony going after both the console gaming and PC market with their upcoming PlayStation 2, and since the Dreamcast never lived up to corporate expectations, something new was needed to compete with the PS2. Because after all, no one really believed that the PS2 would be Sony's final form. Microsoft would even go as far as to consider acquiring Sega completely, with this idea being floated around as Microsoft saw this as potentially an easier way to enter the console space and slow down Sony's advances. In-house hardware manufacturing can also be hugely costly, so the acquisition of a company with a track record with such endeavours seemed like it could be practical. Joaquin Kempin states that this never happened due to a decision from Bill Gates himself, with Gates by that point of viewing Sega as not having enough muscle to stop the PlayStation 2. Kempin adds, there were some talks, but it never materialised because Sega was a very different bird. It was always Sony and Nintendo, right? And Nintendo had some financial trouble at that point in time, so Sony came out with the PlayStation and BANG! They took off, and everyone else was left behind. It was here that Gates soon realised they had no practical options left, and would need to do their own thing by making a console to call their own. Well, that's the end of that then, right? The Dreamcast died, the Xbox was born, and that was it. Except it was a bit more nuanced than that. With Dreamcast sales diminishing and Microsoft announcing that the Xbox was on the way, Sega chairman Isao Okawa would visit Microsoft headquarters to push his agenda for a collaborative hardware idea of his very own. 
Okawa would present an idea that he viewed as beneficial to both companies, as not only would his plan allow for consumers to carry on playing Dreamcast games, but it would also give future Xbox owners, and even Sega loyalists, a reason to choose the Xbox over the Sony and Nintendo competition. The Sega chairman's plan was simple in theory, manufacture the Microsoft Xbox so that it would be compatible with the entire Sega Dreamcast physical library of games. To be fair to the Sega man, the idea sounds like the stuff of dreams. However, the confident Microsoft would unfortunately turn down his proposal because a huge marketing point that the Xbox would be based around would be its heavy emphasis on online functionality. So with few Dreamcast games being around that had a focus on such a feature, the American technology giant showed little interest, especially when we consider that Microsoft would have needed to retool their entire game console to even make the compatibility a thing. It's a shame because a Sega Xbox would have been damned cool. Apart from this feature being cool though, if the Xbox had been marketed in Japan as a system that could play Sega games, then I guess it could have potentially sold a little bit better over there. You see, Japan is historically a country that holds a great deal of scepticism when it comes to buying American electronics and tend to opt for products created in Japan whenever the opportunities arise. For this reason, right up until this day, the Xbox range has historically sold abysmally over in Japan, so maybe things could have played out slightly differently with a bit of additional Sega branding. While the existence of Xbox Live would not allow for a Dreamcast compatibility deal to take place, a strong positive relationship between Sega and Microsoft would persist. It is now on record that Sega would become one of the very first major third-party publishers to back the Xbox, which was announced all the way back at the Autumn 2001 Tokyo Game Show. At the event, a total of 11 different Sega games would be announced for the new American hardware. Microsoft viewed this as a massive coup at the time, and despite what history would later tell us, this was seen by them as a potential gateway to grab the much needed attention of the Japanese gaming public. In terms of working with Sega, it would be pretty difficult to argue a case that the Microsoft Xbox controller was not directly influenced by that of the Sega Dreamcasts, with the pad featuring a similar button layout and even a two peripheral slot atop the device. Now you're playing with power, Microsoft pa PC processing power, that joke doesn't even make sense. But if you think that rounds up the Sega Xbox story, then you are wrong, as a few more intercompany things would occur too. For starters, Sega of America president Peter Moore got so comfortable in his dealings with Microsoft that he would end up resigning from his job at the Japanese-owned company to continue his working life at Microsoft. Also, while the famous Naomi arcade board stems from the Dreamcast's technology, the later Sega Chihiro arcade board would instead be derived from Xbox technology, presenting Sega with a modern, easy way of getting their famous arcade games to a home console. To put into perspective how much Microsoft valued Sega as a brand, perhaps the biggest compliment of all though is the fact that for both the European and Japanese Xbox launches, the system would come pre-packed with Sega produced games. These were Jet Set Radio Future and Sega GT 2002. It does not get any more early 2000s Sega than that. That same year, the likes of Crazy Taxi 3 High Roller, Panzer Dragoon Auto, The House of the Dead 3, Toe Jam and Earl 3 Mission to Earth, 
and World Series Baseball would all arrive on the system as Xbox exclusives. Speaking of Sega software, while Peter Moore was still the president of Sega of America, he had signed a deal with Microsoft to ensure that Shenmue 2 would never come to the Sega Dreamcast in the US, but instead only to the Microsoft Xbox. This was part of the pivotal role that he played at Sega in moving the company's business strategy to become a platform agnostic software publisher rather than a company that also put out game consoles. Bearing in mind that this man would shortly leave Sega to begin a new job role at Microsoft, this more than raised a few eyebrows, especially as he is the businessman who is widely considered responsible for the Dreamcast being discontinued stateside, with some even believing he intentionally misused Sega for opportunities to climb the career ladder. Moore even tells an anecdote where, by going through a security checkpoint at Chicago O'Hare International Airport, a TSA security agent said, I don't need to see your passport, you're the arsehole that gave away Shem Yu to Xbox. All of this aside, due to the early links between the Xbox and the Dreamcast, many view the Xbox today as the spiritual successor to the Dreamcast, or even the Dreamcast 2, if you will. But if that's the case, does that mean that the Xbox Series X is really just the Dreamcast 5? Well, no, not really. As continuing where the Dreamcast left off and offering loads of Sega exclusives, only lasted for an incredibly short amount of time, which contradicts the argument somewhat that the system was the spiritual follow-up. You see, by as early as 2003, the evolution of Sega and their new business endeavours would continue with them developing a much clearer strategy for their future that would involve them becoming a multi-platform publisher, releasing many games for both the Nintendo GameCube and Sony PlayStation 2. Still, while Sega games could be found literally everywhere that generation, with roughly over 50 games released on the Xbox, eclipsing the offerings that were available on the GameCube, a point though that I hardly ever hear anyone make though, is that the PlayStation 2, incredibly, offers over 150 different Sega titles. So, if any console is the Dreamcast 2, it's the PlayStation 2, not the Xbox, as that is the console that Sega chose to most heavily support that era. For everyone in my comment section the other day go, <laughs> actually, the, the Xbox is just a Dreamcast 2. <laughs> oh, you're wrong, aren't you? As much as at one point Sega would plead with Microsoft to make the Xbox backwards compatible with the Dreamcast, this idea would be rejected and in the future Sega would contribute more of their resources to strengthening Bill Gates' worst nightmare rather than backing the Oracle himself. Looking back at everything though, his fears were never fully realised and the Sony PlayStation never replaced PCs, despite the PS2's heavy support from Sega. Could PlayStation have conquered the PC's market if there was no Xbox to slow the brand down though? I'll leave that one for you to ponder in the comment section. I think the main thing we can take from all of this is the myth is busted that the Xbox is the spiritual Dreamcast 2 despite some ties between the two companies in Xbox's first 12 months. But the push by Sega for it to become such a system certainly happened. So I am Lady Decade and that was the story of the Sega Xbox nerds. Well, anyway, if you enjoyed my video, then please like, leave a comment, actually me, 
um, hit that subscriber button and the notification bell. Follow me on all of my social medias. Um, and then also, you know I just said subscribe. I really need you to subscribe because I want, no, I need, need one of these quite urgently by approximately the 4th of January. So the faster you could all, you know, subscribe, then the quicker I can order one of these. Well, anyway, as you know, at the end of my videos, I like to answer questions from my patrons. And today's question is from Riding Retro Radio. And they ask, what's your favorite video game soundtrack and why? So for me, that took me a while to think of a couple of answers because there isn't just one, there is absolutely loads of video game music that I like. I mean, even stuff back on the flipping spectrum is outrageous. Um, so at first I was going to say the soundtrack for Xenoblade Chronicles because that's just amazing. And then that made me think, no, Xenoblade Chronicles X because the music in that you can if, you, if you're driving on a motorway to that, it's just like makes the best journey ever. Which then made me think, no, Super Castlevania 4. Because that's what I listened to when driving to a real Dracula's castle, um, Brand Castle in Transylvania. And um, for a laugh, we listened to that. So maybe that's my favorite video game soundtrack. Um, but then I just thought it would be easier to cheat and say, that the soundtrack to Smash Bros is my favourite because then that just encompasses basically everything that I've just said um, apart from the spectrum music. So that is going to, be, going to be my cheat answer but if you're going to twist my arm and demand a straight answer then I'm just going to irritate you all and say Final Fantasy 7. Alright, see you all in the next video. Subscribe, I need one of these. Goodbye.